Hello and welcome to Key Sessions, a programme that showcases the best upcoming music acts from the Northwest. I'm Joe Wilmot. Up first, we have a band that describes themselves as something that I've certainly never heard of before, a flamboyant jazz punk band. This is Ask My Ball.
Hi, I'm Fritz, I play guitar. Hello, I'm Tom, I play bass. Hi, I'm Harry, and I play the drums. I'm Elliot, I play the saxophone. And we're off my bull. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Ask My Bull came from a conversation that Fritz had one time um, when he was studying at university, is that right? Business school? Yeah, he was having a disagreement with someone and in a bit of a flop he was like, well if you don't believe me, ask Mike Bull, who was one of the lecturers there. And the guy was like, ask my bull? And then it was a bad name. <laughs> Flamboyant jazz punk band. <laughs> Which is the weirdest name for a band I've ever been part of, and probably will be. It's, there's someone said, we are similar, like another band said to us, we're similar in style than you, but less flamboyant. So that's where the word flamboyant came from. I really liked it as a description of our sound. Yeah, like we definitely have festivals where people come up to us and go like, are you guys playing? And we're like, yeah, yeah. Like, what type of music? We go flamboyant jazz punk. And then they just go, I need to see that. <laughs> and then it's so like we just get more people down. Tom is the probably the craziest one. He's the one that everybody always talks about afterwards because um, we've, we've had gigs where when we gave him a wireless pack, <laughs> he's just gone from the, the gig. Like, I've, there's been parts of the song where instead of going like, where is the bass? And like, where is it in the bar? It's like, where is the bassist? Like, he's actually left the gig. Just, just still playing somewhere. Just running around just, the whole site. Yeah, just running around. Yeah. Um, What do you what do you like? I don't know. Someone tell me. Occasionally it screams. Yeah. There's yeah. a few moments in the song where Fritz would have gone. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, I guess it's quite spontaneous then because like there are some times where you're just very glued and like subdued as well, yeah. kind of what you're doing. Yeah. But then there are other times where I look to the right and you just go like ah! and you're just kind of going as crazy as you can yeah. be. Uh, and Elliot? Elliot's kind of just like, it's it's weird to tell, it's kind of the same type of thing as Fritz, I find, in that a lot of the time he's kind of sat there very sweetly playing the saxophone. I'll turn around, he'll look at me and it's like, oh, sweet moment, you know, oh, this is great. I so, think he's got some good uh, eyebrow movement. Oh, yeah, uh, and, yeah especially because yeah, obviously like, you're using like, the lower part of your, your, your face to you know, play the instrument, but the upper half is free. <laughs> on an album which uh, we're currently in the process of hopefully like can we even say the release date um springtime uh, i'm already excited and then like obviously there's gonna be like an album launch for it which people should come down to yes <laughs> if they're free though yeah. it'll be fun not even if not yeah yeah even if you even if you're not free just kind of like skip work skip work skip school yeah if you're sleeping don't sleep <laughs> I think, to be honest, the main thing I'm really looking forward to is is the album launch. Um, you know, we'll book that and we're going to try and make it special. You know, kind of, we've got some cool, really cool support acts in mind. Um, we'll hopefully do something visual as well. But I really want to see how far we can push it. You know, like, how, how many percussionists can we get on stage? Like, can we have a choir? Like, do I know any string players? Like. How many how many trombone and trumpet players can we pull in at the last minute? Like, can I give everyone in the audience some shakers and a tambourine? I don't know. That's that date is the thing we're looking forward to the most. Like, even though it's seven months down the line, we're all really excited for it, and we know we know it's going to be a good day. We're, we're not. It's not if it's going to be like you know when is this day going to be that we know it's going to be incredible. <laughs>
back to Ask My Ball now for the final performance of the evening. Here's Army of Swans.
Thank you to Ask My Bill for coming along tonight. Now for an exclusive interview with the Slow Readers Club right here at Media City. Joining me now are Aaron and Jim, only half of the Slow Readers Club, a hugely successful and widely popular band that spawned right here in Manchester. Guys, thank you very much for joining us and taking the time to have a chat with us. Okay. So let's jump right in. So you were once supporting huge acts like Catfish and the Bottom End. What's that feeling like when you finally go out on stage and you've sold out a venue and everyone's there to see you? Good. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, it's, we've, we've done supports, lots of people like Catfish and the Bottom End and James and things like that. But before that, we were playing to five or six people in, in little bars and stuff like that. So to be playing big venues and have everybody knowing the words and stuff is amazing, so, yeah. Are you, are you thankful for where your careers have taken you? Did you expect it to go this way at all? Uh, no, it, well, we've always believed in what we do. So, I don't know, we don't expect, you know, you don't sort of say, well, I expect to play Wembley one day, because that's, and that's just, uh, there's only one way of going if you start thinking like that, I suppose. <laughs> but um, we've always thought we like what we do and hopefully if people listen to it, they'll come and see us. So as each time we've sold out a venue, We've been surprised that we've done it, but um, it's because of the fact that we just keep gigging and we keep playing and we keep practicing and just getting our music out there. But uh, yeah, it's uh, just going back to that first question, it's really good if people are in a gig, even the smaller venues, you know, when it's really close and everyone's singing the words back and people have tried to get tickets and they can't get in, you know, it's obviously a shame for them, but yeah, it just goes to show that people want to come and see us, I suppose. And there's a song, it was, I think it was something back in Stoke, it was one of your last dates, there's a song that your fans really love. What happened at the concert with that? Um, but, well, it had been picked up, I think, the, earlier on in the tour, actually, people started to pick up on the riff, Kurt's guitar riff from um, a song called On The TV, and they were sort of bounced up and down, and it was just one of the, one of the special moments that you get at a gig sometimes where it takes us by surprise, but... Uh, yeah, it's good, and that like when we yeah. in the break as well, like the, the, the crowd take take that on, and then at the end of the tune we couldn't start the next tune because they were all singing it back to us. That was it was mad. I think was it was it trades. Yeah, that was the last gig of the tour, wasn't it? So that's when it was probably at its most. It's Stoke, it was that. Stoke, 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 yeah, yeah, Stoke. Sorry. Yeah. Was there ever a time that you guys thought, you know, what this is too good to be true? It's going too well. Something's going to happen, or wake up and it was yeah, all the pretty much right sounds. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm just waiting for someone to just come down and yeah. say, no, lads, it's not happening. You usually get that feeling like midway through a big gig, like when we did Albert Hall, Hall or something, you're going, got in imposter syndrome, I suppose. But it's, you know, so far we've not made any make cups, so if I'm not told, I'm not swear, but so far it's okay. going okay. Bad language. <laughs> now, Build a Tower was your album that made it into the UK top 20 album charts, made it sound about 18. Hmm. When you found that out, what was the first thing that you said? Gutted, really, because we were number five early on in the week. We were buzzing, we were listening to the radio and, and they just completely skimmed past it and went just to top ten, didn't they? Yes. So we were fuming about that, but obviously when we found out we were 18, it was mad. You it's got good. a bit emotional, it's didn't good, you? Yeah, I did, yeah. Well, I actually got emotional at number five. I was a bit like tearful on the stairs at home. Because um, we've worked, we've been at it for a long time, like ten, ten years really, and it was a, it, it's one of those things that you've, you've suddenly got something on your CV that no people can see there in black and white that, mm. you know, someone to tell the grandkids in it that you're a, a top twenty artist, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's it just helps more people, you know, when you're on the official charts website and stuff like that, more people probably will get onto you through that. It's just another thing that people that m might give us more exposure, I guess. Yeah. So yeah. And what would you say to? young aspiring artists that are sort of getting their friends together, they want to start a band, what bit of advice would you give to them? Do it. Yeah, just do practice, it. play gigs. Yeah, write songs. Yeah. Do it right as much as you can. Um, you can do a lot yourself, whether that's right or wrong these days. Um, but you can put your own music out there quite easily on like stuff like TuneCore and Ditto or that gets you stuff on Spotify and, and iTunes and things. You can put videos on YouTube, you can use Facebook to reach people. Um, it's as much as there's not a lot of money in the industry anymore. It's completely democratised. I mean, it's the, the barriers to entry to sort of be an artist that's creating music and putting it out in the world are very low, really. Yeah. And hopefully, if it's good, then people will like it and then tell their mates and then. Yeah. yeah. Would you say being in a band is a very if you if you're starting out from the bottom? Would you say that it's a very fun it yourself, lots of hard work, time and dedication and that sort of thing in order to you get back what you put in essentially. Yeah, definitely. You um, but you just gotta keep 
you know, trying and just keep working at it and just keep writing, keep practicing and just play as much as you possibly can. But um, it's not easy. It's, it's hard, you know, we've played some absolute bobbins gigs where literally the people behind the bar are watching us and because they're watching us because they've got nobody to serve because nobody else is in the venue. <laughs> so, and um, we're playing as if the, the place is absolutely hammered. So it might look a bit ridiculous, but um, I suppose you're honing your craft and, and you're dealing with those things. And if you can go to the middle of nowhere, play a gig where there's two people there and then go home and laugh about it, then yeah, you, you can start it again. But if you ta start taking that too seriously early on in your, in your music career, then if you expect too much too soon, which is like a lot of people do nowadays with like to the X Factor and all that stuff, you've just got to work at it. I'm not saying that you can only work really hard and you've got to experience those things. You know, I'm not being like one of those old school people who say you've got to play to two people, but if you do it, then you know, if you can't find that funny, then I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just knock it on the head. And final question, where did the name come from? Um, it was, well, I was going from junior school to senior school and um, getting a tour of all the classrooms. So there's a science labs, English room, that kind of thing. And I came to a room called Special Needs and it was the first time I'd heard that term. And as a kid, I found it quite scary, really, that you could be taken out of the mainstream of education. And it's a rejection of that concept, I guess, and the sort of champion of the underdog. That's, that's kind of where it comes from. Amazing. Aaron. Cheers. Jim. Cheers. Cheers. Thank, Thank you very much. Nice one. Appreciate it.